Hello again, AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here, and welcome to video number two covering our topic 6.12, Integration by Using Partial Fraction Decomposition. Hopefully you had a chance to check out video number one, which gave you a nice introduction to this new technique. We're just going to expand that idea a little bit. As you can see from the title, we're going to look at a fraction with three distinct linear factors. So let's take a look. We're integrating in problem number two, 3x squared minus 7x minus 2, all divided by x cubed minus x. So we've got the, the makings for a nice partial fraction decomp problem. So how we're going to start this is we're going to forget for a moment that this is a calculus question, and we're just going to rewrite this particular expression, but we're going to factor that denominator. And that denominator is going to factor so that we can bring out an x, and hopefully you all see that this would be leaving you with an x squared minus 1, which means we can factor it even further into x minus 1, x plus 1. It's a difference of squares. It wouldn't matter what order that you write those in, of course. Now the numerator, if you're thinking, oh, well, maybe that numerator might factor and maybe it would lead to a cancellation. By all means, we would want you to do that to make the problem simpler, but that numerator I just don't think it's going to factor into anything that, that's going to help us or if it factors at all. So we're going to leave it like that and keep moving on to our partial fraction decomp. In this particular problem, as the title suggests, we will have three partial fractions. And again, it does not matter which order you write these particular factors. We know that we're going to put the constants a, b, and c at the top. We always join our fractions with plus signs because if a minus sign was to come about, it's going to be because an a or a b or a c is going to take on a negative value. All right, if you remember the next step, multiply through by the common denominator, in this case x, x minus 1, x plus 1. That's going to pretty much wipe out any denominator that's on the left side of the equation. And then for the right side, this capital A is going to be joined by x minus 1, x plus 1, because the x would have canceled with the denominator. And the B is going to be joined by the x and the x plus 1, because the x minus 1 would have canceled. And when you multiply this by x, x plus 1, x minus 1, you can see that the x plus 1s will cancel. And so you're left with x times x minus 1. So we got a little bit more going on here, but the idea is going to be the same. Remember, we're going to use the heavy side method. The heavy side method just suggests that you select very opportunistic values for x. It makes absolutely no difference which x you start with. Maybe in this case, I'll choose the first x that I see that would wipe out one of my terms, like say an x equal 1. So if we let x equal 1, we must do that throughout the entire equation, and that does include the left side. So over on the left side, we would have 3 times 1 squared minus 7 times 1 minus 2. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to write that out so that we can see what's happening. So there's our left side. We'll simplify that in a moment. And now for the right side, I tell you what, let's go ahead and just get rid of terms that we know are going to disappear, like this entire expression with A, gone. Now the B expression is going to stick around because we're going to have a B times 1 times 3, but the C expression is completely gone, and that means that we're going to be able to solve for B. Over on the left, we get 3 minus 7 minus 2, which I believe is negative 6. And if negative 6 is equivalent to 3 times b, we have just found our b. b is negative 2, one third of the way there. Now just uh, think about choosing another value for x. Maybe you choose x equal negative 1. Again, it doesn't matter what order. We're going to plug negative 1 in for all of the x's that we see. Here's the left side. And we'll do the same thing with the right side. Hopefully you notice the A term will disappear. The B term is going to disappear. We're still going to have C multiplied by negative 1 times, I believe, negative 2, since negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. 
Careful when you simplify this. Maybe we'll go a little slower here. 3, negative 1 squared is 3, 7, and 1 multiply to make 1. The negatives cancel. So we got something that looks like this. But before long, we're going to get 8 on the left side is equal to 2c on the right side. So we found our c to be 4. We only have one more to get. And we're going to choose another x value. At this stage, as I said in the last video, it really doesn't matter what x value you choose. You're going to be able to get the value that you need for a, but you might as well pick the easiest x value, and that would be 0. We have yet to plug in 0, because that's going to make both the b and c's disappear. So if x is going to be 0, the left side, I think we can tell, is going to be negative 2. And then the right side, well, we're going to have a times negative 1 times positive 1, which pretty much suggests that a is going to be positive 2 by the time we divide both sides by negative 1. So now we have it. So basically, this integral up here that we're trying to find, and I, I'm going to go ahead and rewrite it just so you can kind of put the pieces together. I guess you wouldn't necessarily have to do this in your work. Um, I would assume that you're just rewriting the original problem with my next step that I'm about to show. But what we have now is the integration of, well, we start with a over x, which is 2 over x. Next up, we have plus b, which is, uh-oh, negative 2, no harm. We're just going to use that negative bring it out to the front, change this to a minus, and then we have positive 2 over x minus 1. And then we finish up with a plus, c is positive, so that's going to stay as a plus over x plus 1. And quite honestly, when you get down to this point, there's really not much to integrating this. We just have three different uh, log forms, so we're going to put it all together. 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1 plus 4 times natural log absolute value of x plus 1. Don't forget your plus c. It's a great answer. We can leave it like that. However, there is a way that you could rewrite this, simplify this a little bit. I just want to make sure that we bring this to your attention. But whenever we see powers, or I'm sorry, <laughs> coefficients in front of the natural log, we know that those can become exponents. So we could rewrite this so that this absolute value is squared. We could write, write this x minus 1 so that that absolute value of x minus 1 is squared. Well. If these absolute values are being squared, is it really important that we have absolute values around them in the first place? What does the minus, what does the plus do? So I'll tell you what, let's take a look and see what the calculator does and maybe let that kind of drive how we uh, could have rewritten. So back to our TI Inspire software, you can see I've already taken the liberty of entering in this particular integral to save some time. Let's hit enter. Yep, we notice we have something just a little bit more complicated, perhaps, a little bit more going on. So I'm going to go ahead and snip this. Let's just do it this way. I'm going to snip this out of here, and then I'm going to bring this back into the other document. So here we go once again. I've got my handwritten answer from before. I've snipped in the calculator response that you can see over here. And really, we've got equivalent expressions. Um, what I wanted to do, though, is double check something because sometimes we can find ourselves making errors if we're not super careful. So I notice here that I've got a natural log of x to the second power, which is all fine and dandy. And this plus sign means we're going to be multiplying by an x plus 1 to the fourth. And then this minus sign here in the middle means we're going to be dividing by x minus 1 to, well, apparently I should not have a squared there, but it should be a cubed. And if I check my, my work, I should be able to find out where I went wrong, and I went wrong somewhere with the b coefficient. So if we look back at b, let's see if we can see what happened here. 
So when we let x be 1, 3 minus 7 minus 2 equals. That looks good. But when I go over here, I think I took 1 plus 1 and said it was 3 when it certainly should have been a 2. And if you caught that a lot earlier, congratulations. You caught our little troubleshooting error here. So our b should be negative 3. It's a very easy thing to fix. We just basically go back. We change this 2 to a 3. And we change this 2 to a 3. Now, this brings up a great conversation for two reasons. First of all, the importance of being able to check your answer and find a mistake is extremely important. And secondly, I like the fact that we have an odd exponent. Because the nature of the odd exponent suggests that the absolute values would still have to stay around because there is no guarantee that the value x minus 1 is going to be a positive number when we cube. So you have sort of a mixture in this problem of some pieces that have the absolute value and some pieces that don't. And it's possible on some multiple choice problems that you could see the answer options simplified to that degree. Anyway, I hope this helps out and we'll see you at the next video.